blessing means involvement, finding the correct path. This is what blessing means. It has nothing to do with the fact that you can transcend human cares of the world. Our path can get muddy, you know that. You can get hurt, you can get disappointed, but only through involvement, not separation, through engagement in the world do we find blessing. Not above, but through. That's the key preposition. Purpose offers a curious freedom. We're told in the Christian tradition that his yoke is easy. Well, it's not easy, friends, because it's stress-free. It's not easy because it's not hard. It's easy because it fits. Real freedom is not found by doing less, but by doing what fits. No, presence and what fits are two other key principles in my thoughts with you this morning. This commitment, this freedom, is beautifully illustrated by Earl Pacinger, who is, uh, I talk about in my book, Earl was one of the top captains in the LAPD who started all sorts of programs for kids, uh, including mentoring. And he just says this very clearly. Look, he has given me my life, capital H. I've been given a huge amount. Look what he gave me. Look what others have given me. Five generations ago, my people were slaves. They sweated in the fields. The baton was passed through the years. Some ran with no shoes and no food. My daddy ran in sneakers on a cinder track. I ran in college with spiked shoes on a smooth track. Because of them, I will pass the baton. My sons are waiting. I will not trip, I will not fall, I will not be discouraged, I will not be stuck. If I have to pick up the community by myself, I will do it. Some of you <coughs> may worry, some do, about the religious involvement in issues of the state. The state must never dictate or control religion or the reverse. Church and state must be separate, but the faith community is bound by its prophetic voice to challenge a state when it oppresses, demeans, separates, and vilifies. Think of our own history in this country, friends. The church has played a seminal role in the creation and evolution of this nation. First of all, think of schools how many schools, and hospitals. Presbyterian in the name, Mount Zion, Adventist, colleges, Harvard was Congregational, Brown was Baptist, uh, Georgetown, Catholic. And the faith community led its three most seismic changes in this nation. Civil War, women's suffrage, and the Civil Rights Movement, all spurred by the faith community. And the very framing of who we are read the Federalist Papers, was based on checks and balances. You scratch through the surface of that. It had to do with a view of man, a view of man that had a will to power, a will to dominate. It's very clear that because of original sin, you had to have checks and balances. And thank God, a few days ago, we had a major check in this country. John DeLulio, first director of the White House Office of Faith-Based and Community Service, said, Houses of worship build and sustain more social capital of more varied forms than any other type of institution in America. Half of America's stock of social capital is religious or religiously affiliated. Religion helps people internalize an orientation to the public good. So friends, you're not alone. Just look at you Salters, the social capital that you bring and what set successes you've had. The Reverend William Coffin asserts that Christ came not as an oracle or an answer, but a presence. I think that's a huge construct. Those wanting a way out, he offered an invitation in. It's Abraham Heschel, rabbi, author of Moral Grandeur and Spiritual Audacity joining Martin Luther King on the Selma Bridge, who said, I felt my feet were praying. Isn't that beautiful? The combination, I felt my feet were praying. Michael Miller, another person in my book, who runs a Jewish 
social action group in New York. As Jews, it's our obligation to assist God to leave the world a better place. We are not God, but we are his partners in creation. We are called to show up, as indeed you Salters have. I, if I call you Salters, John, I think it's better than Saltines. But <laughs> I call you Salters. Christ didn't hand us a position paper. No, he showed up healing the sick, uh, communing with friends and outcasts, smashing the ATM machines in the temple, railing against the wealthy and the powerful who would crush the poor. Note the combination, comfort and challenge. Let's recall it to show compassion for an individual without showing concern for the structures of society that make him an object of compassion is to be sentimental rather than loving. Compassion is a must, but not alone. Amos did not say, let compassion roll down, but let justice roll down. Uh, and I have several biblical quotes, but you have a lot of speakers here, so I won't explore those. I would note, though, that the social justice, social gospel movement of the late 19th century and early 20th centuries that triggered in major child welfare reforms, uh, work reforms, the meatpacking industry, child labor, all the settlement house movement of Dorothy Day, started off as a social gospel movement, which I find odd. It seems separate from faith, faith and this movement. No, they're part of the whole, they're integral. Not my faith, my personal relationship with God, and then the social gospel. They are wedded. Think of the Abrahamic tradition, God of love and compassion, and a God who calls us to actively help the oppressed. Jeremiah, he judged the cause of the poor and needy, and that was well. Is that not this to know me? No, we are not a national religion. Our faith cannot and must never be captured by a nation. The policies that affect people, especially those on the edge, with weak or no voice, that is where we are, that is where you are. And we've got to watch it, or at least I've got to watch it. When I was divinity school and full of civil rights, inspired by Martin Luther King, there were deaths, there were lynching, and the bishop's wife in Massachusetts, this is in the uh, Episcopal Church, was jailed. I stormed into the dean's office, young, self-righteous adolescent, and said, this school has got to be closed. Why is everybody here? Why aren't you all on the street? And Dean Coburn, ever patient with me, ever kind, said Jack, somebody has got to be here to keep the flare, the torch of the covenant, the covenant alive so that you can come back and know why you do this work and are sustained by doing this work. Joe Hines, also in my book, uh, DA in Brooklyn, runs a huge, huge um, area in Brooklyn and started a program called Congre Youth Congregations in Faith Together, where he has people from several religious traditions, about 200 of them, mentoring first and second offenders. The results are off the charts, very little recidivism. And he's doing three or four other things, and he said the only way that I can get through this is the mass in the morning. That sustains me. Um, we need the sacramental, the smudge on the forehead, that while giving us strength, remind us of our mortality and fallibility and our need for forgiveness. Now, we also, and this is another key point, as I see you here together, we cannot do this alone. We must go forward in community. If we go it alone, we will fall to solitude, to fear. We have got to do this in community. Christ started a community. The call for healing, fierce love, resolve, and going forward shone like a beacon at the temple at Israel, the service I attended following the murders at the Tree of Life in, uh, synagogue in Pittsburgh. Just listen to a few of these beautiful words from that service. We are called to welcome and love the stranger, 
to repair the world, we must fight against the urge to retreat, to cower in fear alone, rather than to move forward together as a family, holding each other, supporting each other, inspiring each other to move forward, always forward in unwavering resolve, another keeping on principle. Now, we're grounded in faith, we're propelled by faith, but this is not to say we should proselytize. Uh, this reminds me of the story of three chaplains at a university in the northern Midwest who felt they were really good, but that they really hadn't been challenged. So they decided to challenge each other and go out and convert a bear. They met in a hospital a week later, and the first one, the first one to speak was Father Brennan, and he had a broken arm, and he said, I found that bear. I read him the catechism, he hated it. He knocked me around, he okay. slapped me around, I sprinkled holy water on him. Mm. The bishop's coming to baptize him. Next one was Billy Bob Jones. Billy Bob Jones said, I do not believe in that sprinkle stuff. I believe in the word. The word didn't, the bear didn't like that word. He wrestled me up the hill, down the hill, up the hill, down the hill, into a pond, and he came up crazy with water dripping. He had a broken arm and a broken leg. They turned to Rabbi Rosenthal, who had two broken arms, two broken legs, and he looked up weakly and said, I knew I shouldn't have started with circumcision. <laughs> 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 